Welcome to the Entrepreneur on Campus podcast. Let's go. My name is Matthew Brown. I am a student, I am an entrepreneur, and I love learning. I've created this podcast to help you discover hidden opportunities. What's up, fellas? So I, for this interview, I, I drove up to an office. It wasn't Susan's office. We met at a different office. Um, the Silicon Slopes office, Silicon Slopes, Utah, and they just had the nicest equipment ever. And after leaving, I just got so mad at myself that I didn't take a picture with Susan there because it was like a recording studio, legit recording studio. And it was so much better than what I usually use. So enjoy the audio. Um, anyway, so I, I met with Susan Peterson and she was just awesome. I'm so glad that I was able to connect with her. So Susan, she owns a company called Freshly Picked, and she's been running it for about 10 years now, and she's just dominated. Um, Let let me tell you a little bit more about her and about where the company's been at. So in 2013, she made an appearance on ABC Shark Tank for a company, Freshly Picked. Uh, She started the company in 2009 when she crafted a baby moccasin from scratch for her child, and soon thereafter, she launched Freshly Picked which started with baby moccasins and then later um, developed a lot more products that have to do with early childhood development. And Freshly Picked has become a reputable brand. They're offering high-end shoes and accessories for babies and children. Freshly Picked has experienced over 6,000% revenue growth over the past few years. And in 2015, Freshly Picked became the first woman-owned company to be named the number one fastest growing company in Utah Valley. Susan is just a go-getter. Like, she gets things done. And that's really what came off to me in the interview. She doesn't like to mess around. She just, like, tells things as they are and and just does things. So I was really inspired by her and thought that she she shared some, like, really simple but profound truths in this interview. So um, we talk about the selling to the baby industry. We talk about the online market and we talk about clothing so those are a couple of the the industries that we cover and we go into some of the specifics for each so i hope you guys enjoy it here it is with susan peterson awesome i'm super happy to be here today (laughs) with you susan (laughs) thank you for for meeting for meeting up with me today Uh uh-huh for sure so yeah i've i've done a little bit of research i'm i'm really interested in your story um, as a matter of fact, I, I was looking at just some notes of when you went on the shark tank and, mm-hmm. and, uh, <clears throat> Mark, he insisted that the story freshly picked is the best story of a company he's ever heard. So I feel like we have to start with your story <clears throat> and just hearing how freshly picked started. Sure. Sure. Um, so when, um, I started when my daughter was born, I started just selling stuff, selling it, selling it on Etsy. Um, and when my son was born, I started making the moccasins, not initially to sell, but just for him to have. And um, then at the time I had, you know, my Etsy shop, which was like fairly pretty to fairly unsuccessful. And then an equally unsuccessful blog. And I was just, you know, doing whatever I could, trying to sell whatever I could. And um, I just put the moccasins on my blog um, with mostly like you do on Instagram now, you know, a little flex. Mm -hmm. And uh, without the intention to sell them. And a lot of people were interested in them. So I loaded them up into the shop and sold out like pretty quickly, uh, like about three times. And then I ran out of scrap leather. So I had to go to the leather store to buy real leather. And I went in and I just remember thinking, oh, my gosh, it's so expensive. I don't know who who has $200 (laughs) sitting around, not me. Mm -hmm. So um, I uh, my brother at the time had a window installation business, so I convinced him to give me his old windows. And then I uh, banged the glass out of the windows and took the window frames to the scrapyard to get money to buy them to buy the leather. Wow. And that's how (laughs) that's how it began. It's just, yeah, I mean, basically. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome. Um, so do you feel like you were born an entrepreneur or is that something that you became with this opportunity? Um, 
I think growing up what my parents instilled in me is if you want more or if you work harder. So like we had to buy our own school clothes growing up. Hmm. So if we wanted nicer clothes, we had to have more money. So my parents always, you know, had side hustles, had things going on. Um, So I, I would just, I would, I would do whatever I could to make money. Me like legally, obviously. And, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, but I remember one summer I had three jobs and I just worked all day and this was in high school. And, you know, when I was young, when I was younger than that, I worked like on the farms. We grew up in a farming community. So I was always working and yeah. hustling. Always just hustling to <clears throat> whatever medium it was, like you were just trying to provide. Sure, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so when you started um, like taking this more seriously and, and getting the baby moccasins, um, started selling those, did you find that there was a large um, – were people already selling those? Or no. Or you were the first person out there? Yeah, I, I – I, I I created the category. You did. The first off sold baby moccasins, yes. Really? That's so unique because I feel like in the clothing industry, it, it feels like at least from an outsider's perspective that like everything's already been invented, the ties, the socks and everything, but that's Yeah, so cool. there was definitely like an elastic soft sole shoe and there was definitely a baby moccasin, but to kind of pair those together, no one was doing that at the time. Right. So I'm super interested in what it, what is it like to have a clothing company like do do you get repeat customers do they yeah. just buy one time how does the so so our <coughs> I, so we try to we try to have our first touch with our customer like and i like say we have a perfect customer she's probably um four to nine months pregnant and that's when we that's that's when first contact first contact for, first purchase like hopefully she's oh. purchasing a diaper bag at that point gotcha Stepper bags are on your necessity list. Like you have to, like, you know, when a woman becomes pregnant, she finds out like, oh, what do I need for a baby? Diaper bags are what they say. Whoever creates these lists, I don't know who, like anyone can, but diaper bags are the thing that people say, oh, you need a diaper bag. Gotcha. So hopefully we get her with a diaper bag. Um, We are kind of our, our most dense product is zero to three. So, so prenatal, uh, so that could be like six to nine months pregnant, three to whatever, Mm -hmm. conception to birth. So prenatal and then, um, up to about three years is where we really are dense in product. And now, and and then we have like, uh, hard soles and sandals where we've extended that to be about to five years. Um, but what we're not trying to do is go beyond that. So we're, we we understand want to focus on that. First. Sure, we understand mm-hmm. you're going to age out of our product, and we're okay with that. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And <laughs> what percent of your business comes from the shoes versus your other products? Oh gosh, I do know this. <laughs> and you don't have to give me an exact number. Um, but... I think it's about fifty fifty. Okay, but so I think fifty percent is diaper bags, and then the other percentage. I actually don't know that for. For sure. Okay. Yeah. But it, did most of it start with just shoes then? Mm-hmm. And then it grew into other products as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm curious about your experience on Shark Tank. What was that sure. like? And you ended up making a deal, correct? Sure. Uh, although post, post-show, we didn't close our deal. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell me about that experience a little bit? Yeah. What do you want to know? So <laughs> um, what, what was the difference in your business before Shark Tank and after Shark Tank? So, yeah, from a traffic perspective, like just strictly like traffic, mm-hmm. um, it it doubled post-show and then continued to grow and and has like continued to grow since. Um, and then uh, from like uh, our social media like doubled. I mean, this was like six years ago now Mm -hmm. so it's been a minute yeah and i would say like shark tank is amazing because it is like a huge platform Mm -hmm. so that's a huge launch pad if you take advantage of it Mm -hmm. the success that freshly picked is experiencing now has nothing to do with shark tank Mm -hmm. i mean sure we get a couple of um like reruns and maybe we'll get like a thousand new visitors to the site so it's not 
we're not we're not feeling the effect of it anymore. Mm-hmm. In time, as it's happening, it is a really powerful tool. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. And for a consumer, somebody that has just seen Shark Tank, like they don't understand the process of how you get there. How do you get on Shark Tank? Um, it's different for almost everyone. So for us, it was um, just sending in a tape and then them liking our story and wanting us to come out and film like pretty quickly within a month. Gotcha. And do you have to pitch multiple times or is it just a one time? No, I did not have to. Yeah. But I think like some people go to the open casting call and then get a call back. And I mean, at the end of the day, they are casting a character. Mm -hmm. And I think what what they liked about my story is that it exemplifies, it's like the American spirit. Right. Yeah. Just the entrepreneurial story. Yeah, the triumph. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right. Um, so you, you mostly sell online. Yeah. And you also sell in retail. Yeah. So our direct to consumer wholesale split is about 70 30. Okay. So we're 70% direct to consumer. And do you plan on changing that in the future um, with online? Do you want, where do you want to grow mostly? Um, so I'm fine with that split. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's a very healthy, healthy split. Uh, I like to own the customer. So I like to know who we're selling to, why they're buying. Gotcha. What are they buying for? Um, and when you do mostly, when you do retail, you're, you don't, you don't have that information. And so you can't react very quickly into what people want. Right. Whereas on your website, you can capture their email. You can capture how many times they've come on mm-hmm. your website. Mm-hmm. And then you can set up your marketing campaigns accordingly, right? Sure, sure. So something that we've done to ensure that direct, direct consumer stays as big as it is, is we've launched a membership program last year, about over a year ago, and it's called The Fringe. And so um, it's it's $10 a month, but that $10 then turns into store credit, fringe credit. So you're not losing the money. You just have to pay to be part of the membership. Um, and the money never expires. You can use it anytime. And you get 20% off the site all the time, including sales, discounts, whatever. Um, and you get early access to deals. Um, we have a private Facebook group for fringe members only where we like are very active in there. Like The team is pretty active in there. Mm-hmm. Um, currently, we have about 26,000 members. Wow. And um, hoping to continue. When to did grow you that. say you launched that? A year ago. Wow. So it's grown really fast. Yeah. That's awesome. And your other social media, so I, I was looking on Instagram, you have like 850,000 yeah. followers, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. And like, how did you, is that where you feel like most of your online revenue comes from, is from that community and that following? No. Where does it come from? Well, well, I mean, we have a we have a sales funnel just like everyone else. Instagram for us is aware, an awareness tool, and also um, a, a push people to the site tool. Um, so, email is super strong for us. Um, Facebook and Google Ads are also sending a lot of traffic for to a, for mm-hmm. us. Instagram, although it looks amazing to have eight hundred and fifty thousand followers where it becomes problematic is then instagram says okay well you're gonna pay now so so we've we we have to be part of like we pay a lot of money for people to see our stuff on instagram for the ads or for your account no just just for your account really if you're yeah if you're not paying on facebook and you have a business account and you have a lot of followers even people who say they're going to follow you don't see your organic posts really Yes. I did not know that. How yeah. much do they charge you? No, no, no. It's just you just have to be part of the advertising program. Okay. You just have to be paying, you know, to advertise. Yeah. So then most of your customers will come from paid ads and everything. You'll obtain their... No, no not most. Um, I don't actually know the exact breakdown, but it's like it's a healthy breakdown. So we don't, we're not paying to get all of them. Um, <clears throat> email, like I said, email sends a lot. Uh, just people searching freshly picked baby moccasins or whatever that sends a lot uh-huh. um and our ads um send like a good amount yeah right and when you say email you already have collected their email so yeah. they've visited yeah we previously. have a huge list yeah yeah cool yeah cool um so if we were in today your company was non-existent mm-hmm. would you start the same company or would you 
go a different route? Um, I don't, I don't know. Like, I'm not, I'm not in the baby part of my life. Right. So I don't know if I would start a baby company. I think I would start a direct to consumer brand. Uh -huh. Um, and focus on community and brand building and customer relationships. And you think that the market would still be prime if your company didn't exist? Like according to what you see currently in the market, I'm sure it's ever sure. since you started it that. There's sure. A lot more. So I think that there's a myth that like scared business owners like to perpetuate, which is it's too late. You can't you mm. can't jump in the business. You can't jump in the market. But it's not it's not true. It's never too late to start anything. Like. If you want to start something, you have a good idea. I mean, don't go out and start a Me Too brand. But like, if you have a point of view, you have something to say, you feel like you have something to contribute, then it's never too late. I mean, Away started luggage like two years ago and just got like a billion dollar valuation. Wow. Who would have thought luggage? Mm -hmm. That there was more to write to that story, right? Mm -hmm. But there is. There's a ton more and it has totally kind of cracked that open where everyone's like, oh, I hate this about my luggage. I actually hate this about my luggage. And so now there's a lot of companies solving a lot of problems. And travel is at its peak. We've never traveled more. So it's like a great time, mm -hmm. actually, to enter the luggage industry. Yeah. Um, I think if you're thinking, I need money to start a business, or I need money to do this, or I need someone to help me, then yeah, you're probably not an entrepreneur, you know? But if you want to go after it and you feel like you have something to say, a brand to build a interesting product then yeah go for it yeah what do you feel like have been the biggest pains of selling kind of your type of product the clothing the baby shoes moccasins <clears throat> um i don't i really i really you know baby the baby industry is precious and it is so awesome and i'm i i love being in the baby industry because mm -hmm. i think what we represent is this really amazing part of a woman's life. Um, as a woman and as a human, probably even male, men, probably men definitely experience this too. Um, there are so many milestones in your life where you think when X happens, then I will be Y, right? So like when I get my license, then I'm going to do, I'm going to go out. I'm going to do all these things. I'm going to be a totally different person. Mm -hmm. The reality is you're just picking up eggs for your mom at the grocery store, right? <laughs> you're still the same asshole. Oh, sorry, you're still the same jerk you were before, right? <laughs> Nothing's really different. Graduating high school, graduating college, getting married. You the problems, the perspective, and the point of view that you had prior to that milestone, you carry with you mostly. Um, except for when you have a child, your perspective and your problem solving and your priorities shift in a meaningful way. I feel like I really came into who I was when I became a woman. And so there's this whole, whoa, I'm a different person. Look how strong I am. And it's really powerful and really um, life-changing. Not only, and so there's that perspective. And then also there's this child, there's this little tiny thing person baby that you love so much you've never loved anything more in your life mm -hmm. and time just starts slipping through your fingers and the next day they're bigger and then they're bigger and then they're bigger and they're not fitting in their onesies anymore and it's just like slow down and so the moccasins themselves are so amazing because they're these little time capsules so when your baby wears these moccasins and they learn to walk in them or they learn to crawl in them, or they're like at the park playing, what happens is the leather starts to show those memories. So you have the toe marks for when they learned how to crawl, or you have the footprints from when they're learning how to walk, or the scuff from the park. And as your baby grows out of them, they can't fit in them anymore. You have this like real, tangible, amazing quality piece of, it's like a journal, a memory. Sure, and mm -hmm. moms hold on to leather baby shoes. And so, you know, like put them in a shadow box, keep them on the shelf, pass them down. But as your child becomes six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, and like they can't even fit in your arms anymore, you have this beautiful keepsake. So I love 
the industry. I love the business that we're in. And I love being a part of those memories. That sounds awesome. Um, as far as the, so that sounds like a lot of the positive side. Have there been surprises along the way that you just weren't expecting with that type of business mm-hmm. and industry? No, no. I mean, I didn't know what to expect. <laughs> right. <laughs> sure. You just kind of took every everything came in and. Sure. I mean, moms are passionate and they're post hormonal or hormonal and they're excited and they love the brand and like we just try to understand that. Right. So I guess the way that I'm thinking about it is, um, so my audience is traditionally people who are aspiring to be entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. right? And you just talked about a huge positive of why I should go sell into the baby market. Sure. Um, but why should I not sell into the baby market? What are the negative sides <clears throat> if I'm going to go start a business in that? Well, if you're not passionate about it. I mean, my you can tell I'm passionate about it. I don't. If if there was like huge negatives where I was like this really blows, I wouldn't be in the baby industry. And I'm not trying to sugarcoat it. I think that your life and your experiences are what you label them. And I don't I don't feel like man, this is really the draggiest part of this industry, and I can't believe I have to deal with this crap. Um, so I don't know. Mostly positives. Yeah, sure, yeah. but like I think the takeaway is not go jump into the baby industry if you're not passionate about it. I think the takeaway is find something that you really care about. Right. And then roll with that. Your passion. Mm -hmm. Sure. And as, and as challenges and obstacles come up, understand that that's part of being an entrepreneur and not necessarily tied to the industry that you're in. Yeah. Um, How do you feel like, how important is building a community around your product? Um, for your company's success? For the success of the company? Mm -hmm. I think that, um, I think community building is the number one thing you should think about when you go into starting a brand. Mm -hmm. I think that um, your first community should be, I think if if you look, if you think about it in terms of fundraising rounds, your first community should be your angel investors, which is, Friends and family, hmm. um, uh, neighbors down the street, you know, like your tight community anyway. Like those are the, the first people that you see. Now. Sure, mm-hmm. sure. So if you're starting a Facebook page or an Instagram page, every single one of those people should be following you. I don't care if they mute it, but they should be following you, hmm. right? And then, and then like your angel investors then come, which is like the low-hanging fruit of the people that should be interested in that community. So say if you're going into – I don't know, outdoor gear or whatever. It should be outdoor enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. The really, like, the good ones. Um, And then, you know, like, broaden that and broaden that. Yeah, that's great. I think that's awesome um, for people that want to start. For example, I just started this podcast a couple months ago. Okay. And Where's your community? My community, starting first with the close people, right? and then Friends and family. Friends and family. (laughs) Yeah, sure. (laughs) Um, But from there, you want to you want to go out and find the people that are exactly what your product is for. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So awesome. I love that. Um, so I read something that, w- and you'll have to correct me if this is wrong, but you said plotting your business strategy from point A to to point B is not ideal. No, I don't even remember saying that. <laughs> it was just on the internet. Some random person, <laughs> I guess, just put it out there. <laughs> plotting your business strategy. I don't, I don't even what that meant from point a to point b is not ideal i don't i don't remember that matthew you were deep <laughs> that's a deep cut i have no idea i thought that came from you so <laughs> i don't think so maybe another susan <laughs> maybe it was another susan um so susan i'd love to know obviously you're really passionate about this industry and mm-hmm. what you're doing um what is your process of goal setting um do you just kind of just get up and do things as they come or or do you plan things out in advance Sure. So I usually do goal setting around my birthday because I don't really believe in New Year's resolutions um, in like the traditional sense. I believe in like you should be able to mark the year that that year of your life with um, meaningful things. Um, So as far so so like I'll have 
big goals around um, finance, physical, emotional, spiritual, mental. And my big goals, usually what I do is then I break them down into bite-sized daily habits that I can like hopefully create and work on. Um, And uh, then if, if the habits start, if the habits start working into my life, um, then hopefully I achieve the goal. Um, So my habits that I form, I'm really protective over. The bigger goals and the end result is where I'm flexible, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Can you give me an example of one? Um, <clears throat> so, like, I do, like, an hour of, like, I get up, I pray, I meditate, I read my scriptures. Like, that for me is, like, a non-negotiable. Mm. Like, I'm really protective over that time um, where I'll, like, move meetings back or, like, uh, lock myself in my room or... Top priority. Sure, yeah. Um, and then, like... <clears throat> what I think that big goal represents um, sometimes comes to fruition and sometimes it doesn't. But I definitely notice like those little things make a bigger difference in my day, which then make a bigger difference in my month, my year, you know. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. awesome. And how long have you been maintaining a morning routine for? Oh, gosh, my whole life. Really? Yeah, my dad was really, my dad did the same thing, and it was, like, pretty inspiring. So I like to get up with him when he was li- when I was little and do that. And then, you know, as you grow, you have a couple of years where you don't do it. But I notice if I'm off um, emotionally or physically or mentally, um, I can usually reset it with a morning routine. Yeah, I've noticed the same thing in my life. And when I get off my morning routine, go on vacation, and mm-hmm. it, it completely throws me off. Yeah. It takes a lot of – it just – when you start your day doing the things that you feel like – you feel like you're in control, right? Yeah, yeah, and you can deal with punches easier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so going back to just the industry for a second, um, do you feel like the baby industry, do you feel like that's expanding? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's so different than when I had kids. Really? Yeah, gear is totally different. Clothing is different. Tech is incredible. Um, if you just take Utah, for example, um, Outlet yeah. Care is here, and they created uh, the the sock, right? The sock, which mm-hmm. helps um, it it helps. I don't know if I could claim this, but I'll just say it because I don't work there. But it helps prevent SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, and mm-hmm. um, helps helps they like their thing is like keep babies alive and it definitely has done that um there's rags to rages here or rags i think she is now and she has this darling little one piece clothing thing and um and then there's freshly picked and there's fawn design and so even just within this like small tech community there's a ton of direct consumer baby brands um that are really doing interesting and cool things yeah and um are there any opportunities that are not in your exact space that you that you see that are good opportunities at this time? Um, within the baby industry? Ooh, I don't know. I'm, like, so far out of baby that mm-hmm. I, like, we rely a ton on um, the women in our office that are pregnant or having children and the men. And then also uh, customer insight. Um, and like the way that we do product development is like, Hey, here are the opportunities we see, which I'm not going to share with you, Matthew, on your (laughs) podcast because (laughs) we're working through stuff and then heavy insight, heavy customer feedback, uh, best, best product we can think, heavy insight, heavy product or heavy feedback. Uh, then we tweak the product and we do about four rounds of that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. Awesome. Well, um, let's see if I have, I wrote this down. This is what I wanted to ask you. So something that I ask all of my guests is about what you think about, um, becoming an entrepreneur and about going to college, uh, getting education, kind of what level of technical knowledge should you have and what, like, I, that that's kind of the, the broad idea. Um, mm-hmm. what are your thoughts about education and entrepreneurship? Did you know I didn't go to college? 
I did hear about that. <laughs> yes. So I didn't, I don't know. I didn't go to college. Mm -hmm. um, and so far, what I wish I knew and what I'm going to try to audit is a couple of um, financial modeling classes. Hmm. And other than that, I don't feel like I messed out. Yeah. I feel like um, life teaches you a lot of, and like experience teaches you a lot of what you need to know. Um, I think sometimes in my experience, and I don't want this to come across as judgy, but if you want to start a business, you should start it. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think you should. I don't think you have to go to college to learn how to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, college is good at teaching you um, to analyze and see risk, and being an entrepreneur is completely shutting your eyes to risk and pretending like it's not there, <laughs> and just running full steam ahead. Mm -hmm. And so, when people come in an interview for freshly picked, a lot of times they say, "I want to start my own business," and so I say, "Well, why don't you?" You should. You should. Why are you interviewing here? Mm -hmm. And, you know, usually the answer is, well, I want to learn how to run a business. Um, and the only way you learn how to run a business is you just jump in, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's great insight. I, I love hearing about just how different people. Are you in college? I'm in college right now. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to college for entrepreneurship? I'm going to college. I'm studying information systems. Oh, smart. Um, Very smart. Learning some of the tech side of things. Mm -hmm. And then I am obviously with this <laughs> podcast and just my life in general, I'm very interested in entrepreneurship. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, thank you so much, Susan, for sure. this interview. Thanks for having me. Sure. Thank you, everybody, for listening again. I hope that you enjoyed the audio quality this time around. And I'm going to try to keep the quality there. And also, the interview quality course, I'm going to be trying to continue improving and get better. And also, I, I've loved just having these guests on. They've been so much fun to talk to and to learn from, to, ve to develop the relationships with. And Susan is just going out to do a lot of big things in this world. And so, go give her a follow at Freshly Picked on Instagram. Check out her website. And if you're having a kid, she has very top quality gear, so check her out. Thank you guys again for listening. Feel free to give me any type of feedback that you want. I'm happy to include new questions. Um, if you're interested in learning something specific, because, for example, some of the questions that I ask are um, if, if your company was completely eradicated, like would you start the same company or, or would the market space be completely different? And I, I like to ask... Uh, people's opinion, entrepreneurs' opinions on whether or not you should go to school and when you should start a company, if you need experience first, etc. So let me know what some of your th thoughts and questions are, and I'm I'll be super happy to ask them because I, I want to ask what you guys are interested in as well as what I'm interested in. So just email me at matthewcbrown96 at gmail dot com. And I'll be happy to respond. And, and also, if I think it's a good idea, then I'll, then I'll be happy to ask those questions or apply whatever feedback that you have for me. So thank you guys again for listening. I love you. Have a good one.